let me welcome all of us to the very beginning of the study of the book of books of Timothy. And we are starting with the first Timothy, book of Timothy. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we exalt and magnify your name, asking for the privilege of access, the sound ability to teach, to hear, understand, and to obey, that your kingdom through us may expand to the world around us. Lord, please act and let the ripples be effective till eternity through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Welcome. This is the very first beginning of a general introduction to the book of Timothy. It is good to know that the Christian world of AD 64, when it was written, that Christian world had more technological handicaps than the world's today. For leaders like Timothy to have commensurate mentoring in scriptures, such letters as we are about studying, they are inevitable. Paradoxically, for, for us in this jet age, we have so many. And our handicaps are the relevant social multimedia which confuse and squeeze out the valuable Bible-based spiritual life. And these are things that will have assisted our Christian growth. You know, Christ's return is very near. And when we're talking about the young age at conversion, it should not be a handicap, it should not be a liability. Because Christian maturity is not strictly dependent on your calendar age. There are children these days with great spiritual minds and they are young ones. <clears throat> the Christian leadership needs guidelines such as First Timothy provides. The minister, he is our ministry, they are facts, they are entities. With God's judgment, will examine at the close of the age, which are all stand at the judgment throne, before the judgment throne, the book of Timothy was first written to an ordained minister. But you know, when we're talking about the Great Commission, the expectation of Great Commission respects neither ordained nor ordained. All of us are supposed to be making disciples. So for you and I to be productive, it's beneficial to learn and, benefit, you know, and study the book of Timothy. The challenge to the minister and the ministry, these challenges, they go beyond just being obedient to the word. We must develop courage, not just to teach, but to assist and ensure compliance, regardless of whose ox is God. That's the emphasis of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. And that's Paul writing far away in prison, probably. <clears throat> <clears throat> and this Timothy, the young bishop of his time, excuse me, and he was telling him, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou has attained. He has attained such a status that he needed to be assisted to ascend the ladder of mature Christian leadership. Yes, that's a young man, the dress of the bishop of his time, and that's the civilization beside him on his right side, beach situation, building on the rocks. Those were the, those were the profiles of his age, AD 64. It's also nice to know that Paul wrote this letter to Timothy before he was first of all imprisoned. How do I mean? When you see Acts chapter 16, verse 1, he's talking about when they got to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer. 
they were still they were still evangelizing. By the time you get to nine chapters before, Paul was already a, a, a prisoner. And Agrippa and Festus was talking to Agrippa when he said, it seems unreasonable in sending a prisoner, not just to indicate the charges against him. So Acts is a stretch out of 20 chapters of events that happened as if they were just second days. But by the time Timothy was converted, Paul was still free. When all these letters were written, it became necessary to continue mentoring him, even with handcuffs. So this letter is one of the three New Testament letters, two to Timothy, one to Titus, who are church leaders, who are, who are ordained ministers. Philemon is a layman, was a layman. And it was the first New Testament book to discuss necessary conditions that should prevail in local churches. When you just ordain a minister, a deacon in the Anglican church, first ordination, phrase later on, you need to assist him in setting up conditions how things should be managed. So this is a typical, you know, inside, you know, this is a typical football of the church in those days. And that's a typical local church. You know, the European churches is only the church that had right to bury. So all the, if anybody wanted to be buried, he better belong to the church. If not, they'll just cremate you and put it in a bottle. So, so the dignified burial was for churches, and you see burial grounds all surrounding churches for the faithful departed. That's for another day. Timothy is a masculine name. It comes from the Greek name Timotheos, meaning honoring God or in God's honor or honored by God. When you are talking about the acronym that forms this seven letter word, T stands for trustworthy, I for inventive, intelligent man, M for magnetic, charismatic, O for observant, another T for thoughtful, H for handsome, and Y for youthful. So whether the acronym or the meaning of his name, it was a package of talent and usefulness to the church, and he lived it out. Timothy was the first second generation Christian mentioned in New Testament 24 times. You can see the, the, the grandmother and the mother, all Jews, Jewesses, and the father, you know, a lot of unbelieving fathers, he just is busy with his own decoration and watering a Greek. But this boy was very, very lucky to have been mentored by two generations in Christianity, in Judaism that ended in Christianity. So when we're not talking about the young man that's up, or even when Paul was in prison, there are some energetic youths who just continue from the beginning and they so go to the end. Only a few people like Jesus Christ and so on, Timothy was such a, an enthusiast. So in Acts of the Apostles, it was mentioned John, that Timothy was of godly Jewish maternity with pagan Greek paternity. And that's Acts 16.1. And he came also to Derbe and Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek, mixed marriage, rare in Jewish people. So when you are talking about the geographical map out, we will fix Timothy. No wonder you were talked, we we'll also talk of Paul of Tartus. In the Asian section of belonging, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, uh, chapter 16, he said they came to Derby. You can see Derby and Lystra, they're not too far from each other. You see Iconium, you see Tarsus. That was where they met. And verse 2 says, it was well spoken of by the brethren at Lystia and Iconium. Timothy was sound. If you are well spoken of in your hometown or your church, you must be good. So still talking about the geographical location, Timothy's birthplace, he was from Lystra. And when Paul was talking to him in 2 Timothy chapter 1, he said, I haven't been reminded of his sincere faith 
that's in you, which lived first in your grandmother, Louise, and your mother, Eunice, and I'm persuaded in you also. Only very few people have sound Christianity traceable to three generations. Timothy was circumcised to enhance ministry among the Jews. And you, very soon you find that you know, Paul wanted to accompany him. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews that were in these places. But they all knew that his father was a Greek. So Paul wanted to make the point that this is a man who had been very vast and acceptable to the Judaic faith. And that's relevant to 1 Corinthians 9.20. He says, to the Jews, I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not be myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. There are a few things you take on for the sake of the ministry, not because you, are, you have been a chameleon. To those who are without the law, as without the law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. So there are Christian adaptation necessities if ministry is to blossom when the tide changes. Timothy was an ordained man by Paul and the church. So when you see 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14 says, do not neglect your gifts, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders lay their hands on you. That was to show it was ordained. And by the time we get to chapter 2 and verse 1, sorry, chapter 2, chapter Timothy 1, 6, he was being reminded to find out the flame. You know, when you, are, when, when you have a burning charcoal, and you put and you put air, you put fresh air and find it, you will get the glow. He said, I remind you to rekindle the gifts of God that is within you through the laying of my hands. And when we get there at the 10th study, I could I will remind you of this splash of nine slides, of nine photographs into one, how to find into flame the gift in you. First Corinthians, second Corinthians 122 talks about the seed of the Holy Spirit. Is like an SIM card that will give you that will receive messages. But if you don't have data, you don't have the glue, the full glow of what is all meant. And in finding it, Ephesians 4 30, don't give your spirit, get done with anger, slander, what you are doing behind you in front, wait upon the Lord. You need faith, like Jesus Christ said, to those who believe. Out of their heart will flow rivers of liver. Finding out the flame of the gift of the Holy Spirit is a necessity for everybody who has been a Christian. If not, you will be deep freezer cold, and your Christianity will not be productive. We need it. You need it. I need it. So now later we need to talk about it. So coming on, going on with Timothy, he was Paul's close companion during first imprisonment. And that's Philippi Y1. Paul and Timothy, born servants of Christ, they were companions to all the saints. So when you are seeing Old Testament letters of Paul, you will see Timothy recurrent in and out. In Colossians 1 1, Paul was talking about Timothy, Paul, an apostle of Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, your brother. When he wrote letters, Timothy oftentimes came to prison. In Philemon 1.1, 1, 1, he is talking about Timothy, your brother, to Philemon. Philemon, lay leader in the church, received his letter through Timothy. So he was such a very useful man, and he himself tasted imprisonment. Because in Hebrews 13.23, to Hebrews 13, 23, that you should understand that our brother Timothy has been released with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. That's to tell you that it's not an easy road. We are going to heaven and many other dangers on the way. Timothy himself is dead. 
imprisonment. So Timothy was a reserved individual who sometimes did not enjoy good health. And Paul was not too generous with words, but he called him man of God. But you, man of God, flee from all this. You know, he told him the key to righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance as the weapons of fighting the good fight of faith. So if Paul called anybody man of God, Timothy was number one. He was a fellow laborer. Timothy ministered in at least five New Testament churches. One of them was Thessalonica, when he was writing to the Thessalonians. And we sent Timothy, our brother. He was there, jack of all trees, master of all. When they were talking about 1 Thessalonians 3.6, he was still ministering in Thessalonica, but now that Timothy has come to us from you. He linked churches. He was as good as an evangelist, as well as a good young bishop. He ministered in Corinth, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4.17. Therefore, I send to you, Timothy, my beloved and faithful. So as Paul was trapped and immobilized by reason of imprisonment, Timothy linked to churches. He ministered in churches. That's why to have people who are well mentored so the, the gospel will not be crippled. You know, in Corinthians, not once, not twice, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 10, when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he's doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I'm expecting him with the brothers. So Timothy was such a useful jack of all trades, master of all in here and there ministries. And when you're saying with Silas, he was there with Paul, he was there. And when he was teaching the Corinthians, talking about the importance of Jesus Christ, he said, for the son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we preached among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but him, it is always yes. So Timothy was not just a robber's term. He was a useful vessel of honor who ministered in many churches. And the Philippian church was another one. In Philippians chapter 2, you will see to send Timothy shortly to you in verse 19. Such was this man of God who was very, very invaluable. He ministered in Berea in Acts 17. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. But Silas and Timothy remained there. When the going was turbulent, Timothy was a very, very, very useful hand to do what Paul would do. Is the chaplaincy is just all about that. Majority of bishops chaplain become bishops. They, they, they are usually picked from among the intelligent ones who will, who will be jack of all trades, master of all. So if we're now coming to the map of how things went with Timothy, you could see the profile of the Asian world. You see Macedonia, Thessalonica, Philippi, Berea, you know, Corinth, Ephesus, Athens, that conglomerate of the Asian world where the churches were blossoming, Timothy was a very useful hand in time of trouble. So in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, and I urge you, when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus. He was <clears throat> telling him to hold for the fort. Before I finish this 30 minutes slot, it's good to talk about themes in this first Timothy. One has to do with sound teaching. As for you, 
speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. They will not endure. People will not endure sound doctrine, but don't water. That's the making of a lot of men of God. When people are resistant to sound doctrine, they change their messages to prosperity gospel. Paul was saying, don't get trapped into that temptation. He told him people will not be listening to sound teaching. And this illimited above is showing one question, are you listening to false teachers? There are many in our time. It's only during election that you will know that there can be many prophecies. So when you see the themes, deadly doctrines can be serpentine. They can be subtle creeping in of things of the demons, doctrines of demons. They are part of what God condemned in Revelation 1 2 about the churches. So Paul continued telling him, teach no other doctrine. It's very, very, it's very, very tempting to tell people we are serving the same God. It's very, very tempting to equate Jesus Christ to any other prophet. But when the Bible stops being your textbook, you are, you are in danger of being a false teacher yourself. And not just doctrines, we are talking about responsibilities and qualifications of church leaders. And this is a very convenient table, as Paul wrote it to Titus and Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, talking about the sound leader, somebody who cannot be worldly accused, completely devoted to his wife, avoids extremes and excesses, wisely establishes priority, <clears throat> respected, loves strangers, a skillful teacher, not addicted to wine, not given to physical violence, forbearing, that means <clears throat> he yields his rights. He lets go, if only to make for progress of the work, not an arguer, does not love money, manages his family well, children obey and respect him, not a new believer, has good testimony with the world. All itemized priorities of who a bishop should be and who the elder of the church or an overseer, as the case may be, because the, prof, the profile of your church or your church leader is how your church is weighed. We're not talking about Titus, <clears throat> just following Timothy. <clears throat> and when you're talking about the beginner and the more matured, the elder and the deacon, there is a common ground of expectations, which is in these two concentric circles living one united, you know, platform of one wife, whether you are digging uh, you must be respectable, dignified, whether you are beginning or you are at the, at the exit of career, not a drunkard, not addicted to wine, not a lover of money, not greedy, thank you, not these days, when people determine their own pay package, not greedy, people who manage their own household, people who can manage children, so that your children will not be your, your undoing in social evaluation. So whatever name church leaders were given those days, you know, existed in Acts and the hospital and letters of Paul, they were referred to as elders, shepherd, overseer, deacon, and so on. So when we're talking about qualification of church leaders, they are biblically soundly itemized. They are not a conjecture of butterfly in my stomach. So still talking about themes in the first book of Timothy, we are talking about appropriate conducts for Christians. Be an example to the believer in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. And talking about the reputation, Timothy was challenged and given 
the profile of who a sound church leader should be, he must have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into devil's trap. So when you see the areas where he ministered, then we can now be closing up with ministry challenges. No matter how strong or how great you are, Paul, whether that's some, we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. If you are a ministry, these are, these are like, a, these are like, well, mosquito bites. You want to go somewhere, sometimes there is a wahala on the road, you know, successfully, unsuccessfully hindered, but, you know, God's ministry is not changed. And I can see this Paul chained down like a, a like, a, like, a, how would I call him now? As if he was a criminal. I said, because I preach the good news, I'm suffering and I've been chained like a criminal. But the word of God cannot be changed. So I'm willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Jesus Christ to those God has chosen. So when you are chained down, either by sickness or by politics or by circumstances, don't start to don't start to go into self-pity. See what Jesus Christ has said. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the race, to finish his work. There are challenges. It was in Timothy's city that Paul was stoned and left for dead. Second Timothy 3, 11, the persecutors, the afflictions that, I bef that befell me in Antioch, in Iconium, in Lystra, that's what Timothy's city, in Lystra, what persecution I endured. And out of the Lord, and out of all, out of all, the Lord delivered me. So Timothy saw the worst that happened to Paul. You can see somebody being stoned, holy, 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 huge stone, and he was stoned until he was motionless. That's Acts chapter 14 from 19 to 20. It was in Timothy's city that Paul was stoned and left for dead. So Timothy saw the words that happened to Paul, and those things sometimes, sometimes it's good to see your guy in trouble. I've been close enough to great men of God who led the churches. And you know that the rich men cry. You know, if it, I wish it was crying. Some of them get close to almost suicide. And worse things happen to them. To know that these things, there are no exceptions in leadership crises and challenges. And he was talking about this. And there came there are certain Jews from Antioch and Iconum who persuaded the people and others stone Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. How bit? As disciples stood around him, that's corporate anointing, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas. Sometimes you are so humbled by the worst happening to you in the, in the glare, either of your children or wife or, or some of people, and you, they see the worst that happened to you and how helpless a great man of God can be. It happens when there are attacks. Some of them are spiritual, some of them as a So when we are talking about the ministry challenges, you can see half of this tree is dry and is saying, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. That means when the going is when the going is good, preach. When there is when there is no food, preach. When it's dangerous to say to preach on that one, preach. Because you never can know which one will prosper more. In our closing remarks about First Timothy, it's good to remember the clock. I just I just listened to a news in Malawi of mass burial, not for resurgence, but for storm, for for the tropical storm that killed people, wiping away families. I said, and just Christ said, that therefore you almost must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. It will not be their sin. We, we take our exit in various circumstances. 
And this clock is saying it's time to wake up. Wake up. Ready or not, Jesus is coming. That's, those are, that, that's a package importance of the book of Timothy. The old guy is chained down, but ministry continued. And that letter is seven thousands. Well, you're in Bia Palos and some other jocular areas. When we're talking about military challenge, we talk about health and therapeutic drink. He said, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The current medicinal claims of wine was part of evidence of medical need, even when the man of God is sick. Those who are saying that is why they drink should also get reminded of what Jesus Christ said about the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, verse 34. Who the, you know, you can see the man who was wounded by armed robbers. They went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine to and put him on his own beasts. So that was the stack horn that they used to dispense on, on, you know, oil and wine. So those who say it's because they told Timothy to be drinking, you also could be bathing with wine. The Bible is so balanced that it was current and relevant to the medical profile of that time. And I took some time to download this on the computer on some people who, who are naturalists who talk about 10 health benefits of wine. Rich in antioxidants, lowers bad cholesterol, keeps heart healthy, regulates blood sugar, reduces the risk of cancer, helps treat common cold, keeps memory sharp, keeps you slim, reduces the risk of depression, has positive effects on the digestive system. Some people, because of this, will be drinking wine. But the man, would likely put it under excessive drinking of alcohol can have a number of negative effects on the body, including liver cirrhosis and our liver cancer. So when you want to misquote scriptures, you need to be balanced in the obvious issues of the Bible and drinking. So when he was saying, don't look at drink wine, talking about ministry challenges, and this is a mentoring shall I say, you know, diagram as how, should, how Paul evangelized the world through Timothy, Paul to Timothy, to reliable men and others. That's the way we should get really back going. And that's what Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says. What does it mean to run the race set before us? You are born a Nigerian. How many Nigerian souls have been won through you? He said, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. God has set rays, lanes before us. Some are professional, some are social, in what a way that it is. See relevance in what you are and Christianity. And look to Jesus and make him when the sun is shining. The spiritual goal, he talked about the athletes who exercises self-control to reduce, to reduce, to re receive a wreath. But we have an imperishable, you know. You can see the way that man is grabbing it with his muddy, dirty hand. Maybe the medal he received, we are going to receive greater medals. And we must know that ministry as unto God makes waiting for us, that was a way. God revealed it to me one day when I was depressed. See things written in golden letters, clothes in golden embroidery. And there are crowns in, in the Bible to win. You can see these five crowns refer to the scriptures, the crown of righteousness, that's First Timothy chapter four, crown of life, crown of glory, incorruptible crown, crown of rejoicing. These are, these are areas that you gladden and encourage us when the growing is tough. So what next? The crown giver is Jesus Christ himself, who said categorically in John 4, 34, 
My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So with letters to Timothy, Paul was finishing ministry to the ancient world and to the world of, in which you and I are involved. Yes, it's a good fight worth fighting. First Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. That's what he encouraged Timothy. And when this man was finishing, his mentor's testimony was, I have fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept my faith. Not only did Paul preach, but with, with chains in his leg, with chains in his feet, he was able to demonstrate to his mentee that what I'm telling you, I've tried it and I'm ending with glorious victory. Some key verses of letters to Timothy, I just picked two, one from 2 Timothy and one from 1 Timothy. To Timothy, my true child in the faith. How many true children do we have in the faith, if any? And in 2 Timothy was saying, shun youthful passions, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, and long live. Those who call for one in the name of the Lord with the pure heart have nothing to do with stupid and sincere controversies. You know, they breach quarrels. And those controversies, there are many in the pew, gossiping and getting, getting corrupted.